I first want to say that it's my pleasure to deliver these words uh, prepared by Professor Douglas E. Christie, who could not be with us tonight because of university commitments in Argentina. As a recipient of the RSHM DIHAC Pastoral Leadership Scholarship, and as a former student of Professor Christie, who was also a former student of Sandra Schneider's, I am honored to share Professor Christie's words with you and then a few of my own. So let me begin. Professor Christie writes, it is a pleasure and an honor to introduce tonight's speaker, my colleague, my teacher, and my friend, Sandra M. Schneiders. The pleasure is deepened in no small measure by the occasion itself, the inauguration of the annual Mary Milligan RSHM Lecture in Spirituality. It is so fitting that tonight's speaker is a lifelong friend of Mary Milligan, someone who knew her well and loved her deeply. Sandra Schneiders is renowned as Dr. Rothschild shared, as one of the finest writers and thinkers on Christian spirituality <coughs> in the world. That is quite a statement, but a very true one. Even so, it barely begins to suggest the range of her accomplishments and contributions in the field of Christian spirituality. She founded a PhD program in Christian spirituality at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, and has done as much as any living scholar to establish the field of Christian spirituality as a rigorous academic discipline. Sandra Schneiders is also widely recognized and highly regarded for her original and probing work on the spirituality of the work gospel. She has done groundbreaking work in, the articulating, in articulating the critical role of our religious life within the Christian spiritual tradition, both as a rich historical reality and as a way of life that continues to have meaning and significance today. These scholarly contributions point to a crucial dimension of Sandra Schneider's work. It is deeply, it's deeply ecclesial character. The work she has been engaged in her long and distinguished career has always been undertaken with a view to its meaning for the wider community of which she is a part, her own religious community and the community of the, community of the church. It is work undertaken in service to that community that all may have life and have it to the full. As we honor Mary Milliken by inaugurating a lecture series rooted in the highest standards of scholarly rigor and creativity, we also want to take the time to acknowledge and honor the kind of friendship and shared spiritual commitment that makes such work possible and meaningful. So a brief comment about Mary and Sandra's long friendship as it start, at its start. They met back in 1972 in Rome outside the doors of the Gregorian University, where they were both doctoral students. Mary defended her dissertation in the fall of 1975, and Sandra followed a couple months after. They were the first two women to receive doctorates in the theology from the Gregorian. And so began a lifelong friendship rooted in their shared love of scripture, teaching, religious life, and the devotion to, of much of their energies to the renewal that followed Vatican II. Now just a few words of my own. In preparing for this lecture, I learned much about Mary Milligan, though I never had the pleasure of meeting her. I do, however, trust that LME is more spiritually grounded, a more spiritually grounded place because of the presence of the RCHMs, and specifically because of the life and work of Mary Milligan. I expect that through this lecture, we'll learn more about Mary and Sandra at the same time. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sandra Schneider. of the uh, book that contains the lecture, which you'll see afterwards, and which is the cover, which is up here. And I'd like to thank also uh, Michael uh, Horan and Jonathan Rothschild and the staff of Theological Studies. 
and President David Burcham for his wonderful work just a few moments ago. I'd especially like to thank Mary's sisters, the RSHM Western American Commons, uh, who have been friends of mine through Mary over the years and who have so graciously extended hospitality to me on so many occasions. <laughs> and also joined President Burcham and uh, Mary Nino in thanking those who so generously contributed to endowing the Mary Milligan Annual Lecture Series in Spirituality. <laughs> it's not only an honor, but a consolation and a joy to be able to honor my very dear friend, Mary Milligan, RSHM, by this inaugural lecture, just two years and two days after Mary's death. And it gives me special joy that this celebration of Mary's life occurs during Easter week. On the very day we read the, in the liturgy the remarkable story of two grief-stricken disciples who have just lost their dearest friend, Jesus. It is the risen Jesus himself who initiates them and through them us into the experience that Mary now enjoys in all its fullness. I entitled this lecture with, two, with a twofold question which my experience in ministry tells me is very much alive in many believing and practicing Christians who sincerely profess every week in the creed their faith in the bodily resurrection of Jesus, but who draw an imaginative blank when they try to put modern, scientifically credible flesh on these theological bones. In what follows, I hope to offer some resources for reflecting on the problem of Christian, for Christian faith, of the imaginative implausibility of bodily resurrection. The first question, did the resurrection of Jesus really happen, is about the fact. If nothing happened on Easter, that's the end of the story. <laughs> However, if what we confess is something that did happen, our very lives pivot around that happening and unfolding its significance, that is, what it means for the church and for believers, is crucial. It probably will not destroy the suspense for you if I, to know in advance that I'm going to answer yes to the question. <laughs> Something happened. <laughs> but but to, in, order, in order to unfold the significance of that, we have to inquire specifically into what happened and how what happened is available to us. But all this is only necessary scaffolding for what we're really interested in, namely, why it matters. That is, how the resurrection transforms our life as believers. This lecture is going to be a little longer than most, and partly because I'm not simply going to tell you information, but I'm going to be inviting you to rethink the resurrection for yourself. And it takes longer to think than just to listen. <laughs> the question, what happened on Easter, is really a way of asking, what does it mean to say that Christ is risen? Does it mean that he is immortal, a spirit alive with God somewhere outside earthly time and place? Or did something unique that has happened to no one else yet, except to Jesus' mother Mary, happen to Jesus on the first Easter? And if so, what was it? And why is this unique event significant for us? So I'm going to invite you to think through these questions with me in a somewhat new way from what we're used to in some catechetical presentations or even theological studies of the resurrection. The problem most people encounter in regard to the resurrection is not in their faith, but in the ways we moderns, especially since the Enlightenment, have learned to think about reality and, above all, to imagine the real. We've been taught that it is our reasoning mind that gives us access to the truth. And truth consists in the correspondence of our mind to a freestanding, factual, that is objective reality, like a traffic accident, that is outside of us and independent of our opinions about it. Well, but when it comes to certain kinds of truth, it is actually our imagination which constructs the world in which we participate in such reality. For example, we do not know what it means to be in love the way we know that a traffic accident occurred on the corner of Elm and Main. But being in love is every bit as real. In other words, not all truth is scientifically or experimentally verifiable. Some very real reality is only attainable 
in the holistic operations of the imagination. The resurrection I'm going to suggest is this kind of reality. To approach the resurrection imaginatively is, I'm suggesting, not about establishing objective facts like the details of the traffic accident. It is a way of entering a new world, one that really exists and that we have excellent reasons to believe in and live in, but not the kind of reasons we learn to trust in thinking about what we tend to call objective reality or something that really happened. So to our first set of questions, what do we really believe about the resurrection? And why does Paul say that if the resurrection did not happen, Christianity is empty and we are still in our sins? First, as we all know, being a Christian is not primarily about morality or our relation to church authority or dogmas or even our role in the transformation of the world. All these things are important. But when a scribe asked Jesus what was really basic, primary, non-negotiable, the most important commandment, Jesus replied, the first is, you shall love the Lord your God with your whole being, and equally important, you must love your neighbor as yourself. The scribe replied, <coughs> you are right, teacher. This is much more important than all whole bird offerings and sacrifices. In other words, than all religious teachings and practices. And Jesus returned the compliment by saying to the scribe, you are not far from the kingdom of God. In other words, you are right. But the connection between love of God and love of neighbor for the Christian is Jesus. In John's Gospel, Jesus says, no one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who has made God known. In other words, it is Jesus, the Son of God incarnate, who reveals the true God to us by pointing to himself. I and the Father are one, he says, and whoever sees me, sees the one who sent me. And when the risen Jesus personally encountered Paul on the road to Damascus, he answered Paul's question, Who are you, Lord, <coughs> with I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting? In this brief synopsis of the heart of Christian faith, love of God, who is manifested in Jesus, and love of neighbor, who is Jesus, present to us, you note that the verbs are in the present tense. Whoever sees me, sees God. And I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So we, we are not talking about a theological theory of the Trinity, nor about some kind of pious make-believe by which we pretend that our neighbor is Jesus. The Christian is one who, here and now, sees Jesus and relates to God and to his or her neighbor in Jesus. <coughs> This Jesus, who is the center of our life, is not simply the Christ. Christ, or Messiah, is not Jesus' last name. <laughs> it is Jesus' job description, a title denoting his role in salvation history. Well, when we say Jesus, we are talking about a first century Palestinian Jew who was the son of Mary and Joseph of Nazareth. In other words, Christian faith is centered in Jesus, who is here and now alive, and who is a very specific human being, who is not reducible to his role or functions in salvation history, who is not transformed at death into some kind of cosmic energy or abstract omega point of history, who is not simply a disembodied immortal spirit. However, because we know that Jesus of Nazareth died by crucifixion under Pontius Pilate in Palestine sometime around 30 of the Common Era and was buried in a tomb that was securely sealed we can only talk about him as personally present to us and among us, here and now, if he personally overcame death and is not alive. In short, the first, <laughs> the first thing we mean by our faith confession in the resurrection is that here and now, Jesus is personally alive. The second thing concerns what we're not saying. The focus of our faith is not the ongoing influence or example of someone who once lived, like Paul or Teresa of Avila, but died and is no longer among us. Nor is our faith commitment to a great project initiated by Jesus in the past, which continues today, like the civil rights movement initiated by Martin Luther King Jr. in those parts. Nor is our faith membership, faith membership in a community 
which gathers around the memory of Jesus, the way fans of Elvis Presley gather at Graceland. <laughs> Although an ongoing historical influence, a great world transforming project, and the community, that is Christianity, are indeed rooted in the memory of Jesus. What we confess by resurrection is not simply about the past that we remember, but about the present. That Jesus himself, in his specific and personal identity, is alive and present here and now. And that means we are necessarily talking about Jesus' bodily resurrection. Because a human being, a person, in the full integrity of their humanity, does not just have a body, but is their body. Where there is no body, there is nobody. <laughs> the reason why this fact <laughs> that Jesus is bodily risen from the dead is significant is at least fourfold. First, it means that a real mortal human being, Jesus, passed through human death and emerged into new life as himself and now lives in the fullness of his humanity. No other religion makes such a claim. So we have no historical or theological analogs for understanding it. That is the reason Paul met with such incredulity among his Corinthian and later his Athenian hearers. What Paul was preaching and what we preach today, that Jesus is bodily risen from the dead, is unparalleled among world, the world religions. The resurrection of Jesus inserted something absolutely new, unprecedented, and unique into human history. Second, not only did Jesus personally overcome death, but he assures us that we, who will all pass as he did through the portal of human mortality, will share in that victory. As Jesus said to Martha about her dead and buried brother Lazarus, whose mortal body had already begun to decay, in other words, who was irrevocably dead, those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die, because I am the resurrection and the life. In the risen Jesus, humanity itself has entered fully and definitively into the infinite and indestructible life of God. And thus we, after our own real and personal death, will share bodily in that victory, not as ghosts, or shadows, or disembodied immortal souls, or some kind of participant in cosmic energy, but as our own personal embodied human selves. The resurrection of Jesus is the assurance and basis of our own bodily resurrection, which is not something we can deduce from any experience or reasoning process available to us. Third, the living Jesus is not only present and living in God, but is among his followers, his community, now making them his real corporate presence in the world. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. As Paul said, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. The community of believers is the presence of Jesus acting in the world, doing, as John's Gospel says, even greater things than the pre-Easter Jesus himself did. We are now participating in his ongoing salvific work, not just by imitating him, the way we might imitate St. Francis of Assisi, but because we are his real bodily presence. Fourth, it is not only after death that we will participate in the life of the risen Jesus. The living, bodily, risen Jesus is not only present in God, present in the world through his members who are his body, but also present in his individual followers. Jesus said to his disciples, even as he was about to depart from them in death, my going away is my coming to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. This mutual indwelling of Jesus in the believer and the believer in Jesus, which is the present reality, is the source of the disciples' life and fruitfulness the basis of a personal, experiential union with Jesus, which is meant to develop over a lifetime until it is consummated in the fullness of resurrection life after death. In summary, resurrection faith is the conviction that Jesus is bodily risen from death and now lives in the full integrity of his humanity in God, in the world through his body. 
which his disciples corporately are, and in each believer who therefore is and acts in persona Christi. While growing in personal union with Jesus, which will be fully realized in the disciples' own eventual bodily resurrection from the dead. This is what Paul wanted his converts to realize, that the resurrection of Jesus was the key to everything Christianity had to offer them. Christianity is not one religion among others, precisely, <coughs> precisely because it believes something about Jesus, and therefore about his followers, which has no parallel in any other religion. If this is what Christians believe about the resurrection, and it is of ultimate significance for their identity as Christians, we have to ask the question that challenges many modern people. Namely, if there are no analogs for this faith, how do we know that what we believe is true? Of course, one perfectly reasonable answer is that we know it because the church teaches it. <laughs> <laughs> But the real question is not about whether it makes sense to accept what we're told by trustworthy authority, but how this faith, which claims that something actually happened, namely that someone who was dead came to life, can be warranted as objectively true in a world that reasonably raises scientific and historical questions about claims that seem to fly in the face of human experience, and which non-Christians of goodwill seem to get along quite well without. <laughs> Some of these questions, which cannot be finessed or ruled out of court as the skepticism of heretics or atheists, are the legitimate questions of people who want their faith to be imaginatively plausible, believable. Was the tomb really empty? And if so, does that prove anything about what happened to Jesus? What really happened to the first witnesses on Easter morning? and in the following days. Did they really see or hear or touch something or someone with their bodily senses or only by faith or in their desperate and grief-stricken fantasies? And if they did actually experience something, what was it? Might they have been hallucinating or deceived by wishful thinking? I want to begin by subverting some assumptions that set us up for thinking in ways that necessarily rule out the kind of understanding of the resurrection that I just claim is central to our faith. Because the church preaches that Jesus rose from the dead, in the same kind of sentence we use to say there was a car accident on the corner of Elm and Main, it is easy to assume <laughs> that a similar claim is being made in both cases. That we are talking about a historical, publicly available event caused by observable or ascertainable factors like someone running a red light or the brakes failing. And there are several reasons to call into question this assumption about what it means to say that something really happened. Our sources of knowledge about the resurrection are twofold. The oldest are proclamations of the fact and meaning of the resurrection, like Paul's account in 1 Corinthians 15. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn have received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, and that he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, Followed by Paul's conclusion, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Similar proclamations are made in the apostolic sermons in the Acts of the Apostles. For example, Peter's proclamation. This man, handed over to you, according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in death's power. Much later, we have the narratives of the Easter events from the end of each of the Gospels, such as the stories of the empty tomb and Jesus' appearance to Mary Magdalene, to the disciples on the way to Emmaus, in the upper room, and so on. Most people think the proclamations were the short form of the narratives, summaries of the narratives. 
which themselves, the narratives, are factual accounts of the resurrection event. But actually, it's the other way around. The resurrection narratives are the long forms of the proclamations. The narratives were written later than the proclamations and are not historical narratives like the accounts of the crucifixion. In other words, whatever they are, the appearance narratives are not like traffic reports. <laughs> they are a different kind of literature, and we need to attend to how they can, should, and do function in our faith in the resurrection. Because the resurrection narratives are stories, and they follow the stories that recount the public life of Jesus, we naturally read them as the final chapter in Jesus' historical life. After his mysterious conception, miraculous birth, and nearly unmentioned youth in Nazareth, that's chapter one, birth, Jesus undertook a, a, public, a short public life of preaching, teaching, and working miracles in which he became a threat to the Roman political authorities who ruled Pal Palestine into the Jewish religious hierarchy. That's chapter two, public life. These two power systems colluded to arrest him, condemn him to death, and execute him by crucifixion. That's chapter 3. His disciples buried him before the beginning of Sabbath. Chapter 4. Then he rose from the dead and appeared to his disciples. Chapter 5. Actually, the resurrection is not chapter 5 at all. The resurrection narratives are a completely different kind of literature, or a different genre, from the accounts of chapters 2, 3, and 4. The public life, passion, and death, and burial are intended to recount the historical life of Jesus of Nazareth, as it could have been and was observed by anyone, believer or not, who was present for the events that took place. The Gospels are, of course, suffused with profound theological reflection on and interpretation of the significance of these events. But the events themselves are basically historical. They took place in time and space and according to the laws of cause and effect. We even have some reference to some of these events from secular literature outside the Christian scriptures. But the resurrection narratives are more like the infancy narratives, which are not chapter 1 any more than the resurrection is chapter 5. Both the beginning and the end of Jesus' life make mysterious connections between Jesus and God that are recounted as if they were historical in the normal sense of the word, when in fact they are not. The infancy narratives, which we have only in Matthew and Luke, and are not our concern here, but I mention them for purposes of comparison, they are written in a genre somewhat like what scholars call midrash. We might say that the infancy narratives of Matthew and Luke, which are history-like stories, are to the mystery of the incarnation or the becoming human of the Son of God, what the history-like Easter narratives are to the mystery of the resurrection or the raising to life of the dead Jesus. Both the incarnation and the resurrection in themselves are what some scholars have called trans-historical events. Underlying the infancy narratives is an historical fact that Jesus was born. Without that historical fact, there would be no story to tell. But the tapestry of angelic announcements and prophetic dreams, a star guiding magi from the east bearing symbolic gifts, and so on, may have some historical fringes, details or elements which can be verified historically, like the census of Caesar Augustus. But the point of the narratives is not to recount history, but to tell the reader, primarily by Old Testament allusions, who Jesus of Nazareth really is namely the Son of God incarnate, which is not something you can see. Unlike the historical event of Jesus' human birth, the incarnation itself, that is God becoming human in Jesus, is a divine mystery, a trans-historical reality, available only to faith. And like the incarnation, the resurrection is a trans-historical reality. At its heart is the event that Jesus, who really died on the cross, is experienced as alive in and among his disciples in an entirely new way. Without this experience, there would be no story to tell once Jesus was dead and buried. But the resurrection narratives in which this reality is carried are not stories like those of Jesus' public life and passion. 
like the infancy narratives. The Easter narratives are about something that is the object, not of physical observation, but of faith, but which is woven into history in such a way that there are history-like details and historical fringes, like the conversations between the women and the male disciples on their return from the tomb, which give us access to what we believe, namely that the crucified Jesus is alive. This question of genre or literary form is so important because we read texts in terms of what kind, that is, what genre of text we think they are. If we are reading a novel, we do not expect historical facts. But if we think a text is meant to be history, we expect it to be, in some sense, factual. So if we think the resurrection narratives are chapter 5 of an historical biography of the earthly Jesus, we expect the resurrection narratives to be historical in the sense of telling us basically what really happened in time and space that would have been observable by anyone present at the site of the occurrence, the way our traffic accident could be seen by anyone who's on the corner of Elm and Main when it happened. Beginning basically with the Renaissance, the study of texts that were presumed to be historical began to be what we now call historical critical investigation. And by the late 19th century, there was a fairly general consensus that historical critical methodology was the most appropriate, and many people thought the only modern and credible way to study the Bible. Historical critical methodology, until quite recently, presupposed that everything written about the past, unless it was clearly poetry or fiction, was historical. Now, studying historical events begins with finding out what really happened. And the way to do that is by looking at the physical and other types of evidence, questioning eyewitnesses, reading their accounts, comparing seemingly conflicting accounts, and so on. Not surprisingly, since we have four sets of history-like narratives about the resurrection, which do not seem to agree very well with one another, there has been an enormous amount of scholarly historical work done on resurrection narratives. The project is complicated by the fact that these narratives are about events that have no parallels in our experience. Appearances of someone alive who had died and was buried. So scholars tackled the question such as, was Jesus really buried? Did anyone know where Jesus' tomb was? Were there angels there on Easter morning? One or two? Inside or outside? <laughs> Standing or sitting? <laughs> Sounds a little like my exam, doesn't it? Uh, and in a certain sense, it was. What did they see? What did the angel say? Did Jesus really appear? <coughs> Were the so-called witnesses hallucinating? Did anyone really touch Jesus physically? And so on. These questions, and many more like them, have spawned literally thousands of studies of the resurrection over the last century. Because the presuppositions characteristic of, of historical critical methods of studying ancient texts convince biblical scholars that unless we can establish the, the objective, that is, historical facts about the Easter event, we have no solid experiential basis for faith in the resurrection. We might have other bases, for example, church authority, tradition, or even blind faith. But for the modern, scientifically oriented person, if Jesus rose from the dead, as the texts claim, then the objective facts, or the lack of such facts, had to be established so that on that basis we could decide theologically what we are really justified in believing, and on what grounds, and what are our options if some of the things in the Eastern narratives turn out not to be true in this factual sense. After extensive research on every conceivable aspect of the historical data about the resurrection, we are not much further ahead today in regard to the objective historical facts that the disciples were on Easter Sunday, when in various ways the first witnesses explain, he is risen and we have seen the Lord. Given the material we have to work with, the assumptions of historical critical methodology pretty much rule out the possibility of our ever establishing, with scientifically convincing data, most of what many have considered absolutely necessary if our faith in the resurrection is to have a solid historical basis. 
In other words, almost none of the objective historical facts about the central reality of our faith are indisputably ascertainable. Now, I have long worked with the personal principle of theological research that goes something like this. If diligent and persistent efforts by highly competent scholars to answer a critical theological question do not produce some progress toward a credible answer, you are probably asking the wrong question. <laughs> That's to hit reset on your research keyboard. <laughs> My way of hitting reset in regard to the question of what, if anything, really happened at Easter, is to pursue another approach to the resurrection, namely a phenomenologically based literary rather than a historical critical one. Because I am becoming convinced that it has a better chance of providing what we're looking for, namely a well-founded, credible, spiritually motivating approach to the central mystery of our faith. One that could be imaginatively plausible to post-enlightenment modern Christians, that's us. <laughs> in order to launch this alternate approach, I, I want to invite you to join me in an imaginative experience by entertaining a set of questions. We're not interested at this point in their answers, any more than we have been interested in whether the traffic event was an accident or a crime. We're interested in the imaginative structure of knowledge. So here are the questions for you to think about. What do we mean by 9-11? Why do we call it 9-11 instead of giving it a name like the Gettysburg Address or the Academy Awards? What really happened on 9-11? How do we know? Is 9-11 over? Now let me suggest some responses. Skipping for a moment the first question, what do we mean by 9-11, I would suggest that we call it 9-11 partly because we do not know what it means, or what is most significant about it, or even about some aspects of it, what really happened. We can probably agree that it is the day that two jet planes were deliberately flown into the World Trade Center in New York City. But that hardly accounts for the national trauma that is still reverberating through the country more than 10 years later. After all, we've had plane crashes before and since. And a terrorist named Timothy McVeigh blew up a government building in Oklahoma City, killing and injuring almost 1,000 people just 10 years before 9-11. Fewer than 3,000 people died in the 9-11 attack in comparison with more than 16,000 people who were murdered in the US that same year. In other words, it's not a plane crash, terrorism, the number of violent deaths alone, or even all of them together that accounts for the traumatic effect of 9-11. <laughs> Furthermore, there are conflicting stories about what really went on inside the building that morning. Many of the eyewitnesses or participants' stories conflict or are impossible to jive with each other. We do not know factually exactly what happened, <coughs> exactly what is and is not part of the event, or simply collateral damage, or unrelated side events that somehow got caught up in the drama. And we do not know finally what it really means. So we point to it by recalling the date. 9-11 designates whatever it is that happened on that fateful day. 9-11 is a different kind of event from an automobile crash and not simply in physical magnitude. More important than the objective facts that could be ascertained at the site is the question of the cause of the event. The pilots of the two planes were Islamic-connected terrorists, or at least that's what we call them. They saw themselves as religious warriors, servants of Allah in the cause of justice and liberation of Islam from an anti-Muslim imperialist power namely the United States. The mainstream US story was that they were Al-Qaeda operatives acting from motives of hatred and or jealousy of America's superior cultural quality and economic strength. Conspiracy theorists, on the other hand, have long suspected that 9-11 was a Pearl Harbor type operation facilitated by the US government to deceive the American people into going to war over Iraqi oil. 
In other words, causation in this case is not as simple as whether the car crash was caused by somebody running a red light or the brakes failing. But things get even more complicated when we look not at what produced the event, but at what the event produced. Almost overnight, the freest nation in the world took on many features of a national security state, including the indefinite suspension of many cherished constitutional rights. Behaviors long held by Americans to be utterly immoral, like torture, were adopted by the US government as necessary anti-terrorist measures. The country became, became involved in the two longest wars in its history, in which tens of thousands of US service personnel died or were maimed in mind and body, and hundreds of thousands of Iraqis and Afghans, the vast majority innocent civilians, have been killed. And we cannot even begin to count the economic costs of 9-11. But there were also amazing stories of bravery, self-sacrifice, generosity, and devotion. And all of this does not begin to get the whole happening out there for objective consideration. But in any case, it cannot be denied that the country is no longer what it was minutes before those jets hit the towers. Whatever 9-11 means, it is not over. Let us return now to our original historical critical questions. What do we mean by 9-11? Why do we call it 9-11? What really happened? How do we know? We might not be able to answer with certainty any of these questions, and surely neither Americans nor others agree on the answers we think we do have. No matter how many studies are undertaken, reports published, documentaries made, or theories proposed, we probably never will get the whole picture. We cannot stamp case closed on this event like we will eventually be able to do with the car crash. But the one question we all would surely consider absurd is, did anything really happen? Something momentous happened on September 11, 2001, and is still happening. A real event which infinitely overflows the boundaries of that one day in September definitely happened. And no matter what position one takes on any of these factual questions, 9-11 is full of meaning, which we will be unpacking sifting, arguing over, recounting, and ordering our lives in terms of, probably for the foreseeable future. 9-11 is an event from which there is no going back. In other words, this overwhelming reality has been generating what the philosopher Hans Georg Gadamer called an effective history, a progressive expansion and deepening of the event itself by what flows from it and flows back over it. Phenomenological philosophers talk of such events as saturated phenomena. Events are experiences which burst their boundaries or our capacity to absorb them, which are so overwhelming that the mind reels and language stumbles. The excess of meaning, positive or negative or both, so overpowers our ability to absorb, sort, or respond that we use expressions like mind-boggling, or we speak of being blown away. The ordinary rational mind cannot handle the overload of significance that the happening mediates. With some other scholars currently working on the resurrection, I would suggest that Easter was quintessentially a saturated event. It was so totally unexpected, overpowering, without analog, that no one knew what to do or say or think. The people confronted by the event were literally blown away by what they experienced. Perhaps our earliest gospel account, Mark 16, 1 to 8, in its stark, enigmatic, original ending to Mark's gospel is closest to the actual event. Mark says simply that the women who went to the tomb, expecting to find and anoint the corpse of Jesus, were suddenly confronted by a young man in white garments sitting inside the previously sealed, but now gaping open tomb, who announced to them, you are looking for Jesus. He has been raised, he is not here. The gospel ends, the women fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Mm, yeah. 
This sounds exactly like the first reaction to a saturated phenomenon. One simply has no categories with which to interpret it. It overwhelms perception, shutting down our ordinary interpretive capacities. We cannot think of anything to say that will sound rational or that anyone will believe. We doubt our own senses, and others may think we're simply unhinged. In the other Gospels, we get more circumstantial accounts. Identification of the messengers as angels, references to the rolled back stone and an earthquake, a variety of dialogues, reference to fear and disbelief, flight from the tomb, even seeing Jesus himself, and reporting to the other disciples who disbelieve the women whom they think are hysterical. But essentially, like the basically similar reports from different people who were at ground zero, of jets flying way too low, the deafening crash, everything shuddering like an earthquake, blinding light and thick dust, screaming people fleeing in all directions. The basic data of Easter are fairly similar, of women coming to the tomb to anoint the body, the open tomb, the unearthly messengers, with the incredible news that the dead and buried Jesus is alive, the flight from the tomb, meeting Jesus himself. Now, megaliths do not move of their own accord. Angels do not appear in broad daylight delivering messages from beyond the grave. Dead people stay dead. <laughs> in both cases, there are a lot of inconsequential variations in the facts, which really did not explain anything anyway. But everyone involved knew that something momentous had happened and there was general agreement on what that happening was. The Trade Center towers were hit by airplanes, thousands were dead, and America was under attack. Jesus' body was gone. Unearthly beings were in possession of the tomb. He was declared risen from the dead, and he was even seen by some people. At Easter, as in the aftermath of 9-11, the bare facts never changed much after the first reports. What did begin to develop in both cases were highly circumstantial vignettes of personal experience. A first responder racing from the scene with a baby in his arms. A tender farewell message left on a cell phone. A dazed man coated in white dust and carrying a briefcase as if there were something like business as usual to be resumed. A, serv a service dog leaving his blind master out of the ruined building. People wrote stories, essays, poems, music. They painted pictures. Catching, as it were, through a crack in the enormity of the event, the immensity of what had happened. Makeshift shrines appeared, and official ceremonies took place while eyewitnesses told their stories again and again, sometimes with fairly obvious self-contradictions and or embellishments. Art, both popular and professional, which embodies the universal in the particular, and ritual, which channels and shapes chaotic feeling, were much more suited to capturing the stupendous reality of 9-11 than newspaper accounts or analytical articles or official reports. And that is the kind of thing we get in the Eastern narratives. Vignettes of personal experiences. Peter, the beloved disciple, racing to the tomb, what they found inside, and Peter's befuddlement, contrasted with the disciples quietly donning awestruck belief. Mary Magdalene encountering Jesus and someone she took for the gardener, and on the spot, becoming the first apostle of the risen Jesus. Amen. Two disciples walking hopelessly away from Jerusalem, and meeting a mysterious stranger who suddenly made himself known as they sat at table, and then just as suddenly was gone. Jesus, simply in the midst of the community, locked away in fear. In other words, if the Easter experience was a prolonged, saturated phenomenon, rather than a circumscribed single, single event like a car crash, Accounts of it would have the kinds of characteristics in which saturated events come to expression. We would expect them to be not uniform, fact-laden, and minimalistic. 
but overflow <coughs> but overflowing poetic redundant reflective of the mind-blowing intensity and richness of the experience itself it may be only Mark's original ending that reflects rather directly the tomb event itself like the footage of the actual impact of the planes that was played over and over and over again and really told the viewers practically nothing about the mind-boggling event that had occurred. The other uh, resurrection narratives uh, were surely composed over a period of time and probably reflect not only the immediate experience of the 50 days after, uh, after Easter and, and Pentecost, <laughs> but the way the stories were told, sorry, I'm having a little trouble with the light here. <laughs> the other resurrection narratives were surely composed over a period of time and probably reflect not only the immediate experience of the 50 days between Easter and Pentecost, but the way the stories were told and used in the interim between Easter and writing the Gospels. They are later, fuller, more variegated, less easil easily reduced to a single narrative in which all the details fit together without contradictions or confusion than the bare proclamation of the resurrection we find in Paul and Acts. So let us move from the saturated event itself to the text in which those events are narrated because that is what later believers like ourselves have to work with. And on to the major feature of the risen Jesus which these texts communicate because that's the meaning of the event for Christian believers. Most believers who raise questions about the resurrection are really asking how the testimony of the witnesses is related to the resurrection experience of the earliest communities. Do these Easter stories really tell us anything reliable, that is objective, factual, about the resurrection? Do the stories, by their lack of agreement, diversity of perspectives, variety of facts, and so on, not cause more problems than they solve. For two reasons, I would say no. First, the accounts themselves, even in or because of their diversity, are actually a warrant of credibility about the witnesses. Second, and even more importantly, the resurrection narratives are the primary resource for our faith in the bodliness of the resurrection, which carries the meaning the supreme significance for our faith. Without stopping to discuss all the evidence, I can report that there's a fairly wide scholarly consensus about what the textual material affirms regarding the tomb and the appearances. And that consensus is the more reassuring precisely because the circumstantial diversity in the narratives themselves highlights their substantial consensus. First, the tomb was empty on Easter morning. This does not say what that meant or how it happened, but if the body of Jesus had been available, the authorities, both political and religious, who had a high stake in nipping the Christian movement in the bud, could easily have done so by producing Jesus' corpse, or at least his remains. We have no record that the authorities ever credibly disputed the disciples' claim that the tomb was empty. Second, in regard, to, <coughs> in regard to the appearances, there are several interesting facts about the narrative witness to the resurrection, which suggests that the witness itself is credible, that is, it's trustworthy. First, none of those to whom Jesus appeared are presented as expecting, hoping for, or seeking an appearance, any more than the people going to work on 9-11 expected an attack on the World Trade Center. In each appearance, the, re the recipient was in deep sorrow and despair over Jesus' obviously <coughs> irreversible fate, his death. All were totally surprised, even terrified, by his appearance. So we're not talking about expectation or wish fulfillment. Second, although all the appearances were to Jesus' disciples who knew him well, not to strangers, none of the recipients recognized Jesus until he somehow identified himself. So the witnesses were not inventing the appearances, nor hallucinating. Third, none of the appearances duplicates any other. Although there are similar details that show up in one account or another, such as the wounds in Jesus' hands, each appearance is unique in time, 
place, <coughs> circumstance, content, etc. So they were not copycat accounts. Fourth, all the appearances happened in real time while the recipient was wide awake and in ordinary circumstances. None are presented as visions, dreams, ecstasies, out-of-body experiences, bereavement encounters, and so on. And finally, the appearances started on Easter morning and ceased completely at the end of a particular, relatively short, clearly delineated period of time referred to as the 40 days. So the appearance stories are not dramatic ways of talking about ordinary Christian experiences of later times or repeats by those who had heard earlier reports. They are presented as accounts of absolutely sui generis events, neither produced by nor reproducible by the disciples. In short, the appearances are presented as somehow objective. They happen to, rather than being produced by the recipients. This period of revelation, and that's what we're talking about, revelation, of the reality and the meaning of the Paschal mystery came to a close with the withdrawal of Jesus' sensible presence from them in the ascension. I'm getting that revelation in my eyes. <laughs> the episodes are record, uh, recorded are not quasi-police reports. They are mini-dramas, short stories, poetic discourses, or verbal paintings, relative, uh, reflective of the reality of what happened to the participants during this relatively short period, which empowered them to make available to the whole world the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. During this foundational period, which we might call the Paschal event, this saturated event of Jesus' bodily return to his disciples, Jesus was visibly present to them, teaching them, opening their spiritual eyes to really see what they had seen physically in his public life, passion, and death, opening their ears to hear what Jesus had said to them and the scriptures illuminate and confirm, supporting them in their fears, feeding them, correcting them, forgiving them, empowering them, sending them. He was there day after day. He came to them in Jerusalem and in Galilee, in closed rooms and on the road and at the seashore, in individuals, to individuals and to groups, in familiar ways and new ways. He flooded them with his presence, his intimacy, his nearness. They could not mistake who it was. John says, now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you, because they knew it was the Lord. He came to them and came again, but he never left. They saw and heard and touched and knew that it was Jesus himself, alive, returned to them, but not in their control. They needed to learn by experience what his new presence felt like, how to recognize it, what it meant for them, how it communicated to others. And once the spirit whom Jesus had promised had come upon them, they immediately began to, uh, to share this experience and to invite others to enter into it. Their witness was contagious. Immediately, according to Acts, thousands heard, mysteriously understanding the meaning even when the speaker's language was not their own. And they asked, what should we do? How can we participate in this event? The disciples not only preached, but began to develop rituals by which others could become participants. They invited their hearers to participate in a mystical plunging into the death of Jesus, from which they would rise with spiritual eyes enlightened to perceive God's word in Jesus. And ears opened to understand Jesus' word, and tongues loosed for praise and proclamation. The disciples invited these newly baptized to share table fellowship with them, to do with them what Jesus had commanded, to wash one another's feet, to share bread and wine in memory of him, and to form community. The New Testament resurrection narratives and the Easter sacraments of baptism and Eucharist 
are the witness in word and ritual to the overwhelming pastoral mystery of Jesus' resurrection and the outpouring of the Spirit. A striking feature of participation in the saturated event of the pastoral mystery was its totally egalitarian inclusivity. The Easter appearances were to women and men, members of the 12 and of the 72, and crowds of hundreds. To ordinary disciples like the two, probably an ordinary married couple on their way to Emmaus, and those members of the 12 and others without names, who were with Simon in the boat on the Sea of Tiberias. The Spirit was poured out equally in identical individual tongues of fire without distinction as to rank or human mediation on the whole gathered community of 120 who were gathered together between the Ascension and Pentecost. The Paschal event was an ecclesial, was an ecclesial foundation the coming to life of the body of Christ, not the establishment of a hierarchical institution. All that came later. <laughs> and as the disciples began to welcome others into this experience, they realized that in a way that transcended the first covenant, it was intended, it was intended for all, women as well as men, Jews of the diaspora as well as Jews of Palestine, proselytes as well as born Israelites, Gentiles and Jews, slaves and free, young and old, poor and rich, sinners and saints. Underlying and making possible the absolute conviction of the disciples about the reality of the risen Jesus and his presence among them, and central to the preaching and rituals by which they facilitated the conversion of others, was the most striking feature of the narratives themselves, which grounded the continuity between the earthly pre-Easter Jesus and the risen Jesus in the pastoral community. Herein lies the ultimate significance, the real meaning of the Easter experience. All the Easter narratives are stories about Jesus himself present bodily. In this respect, the, re the resurrection narratives are not just artistic or imaginative productions reflecting a saturated phenomenon, <coughs> nor an assurance of a spiritual presence of a remembered loved one. They have a very peculiar, particular content that is central to the revelation of the resurrection. The first witnesses in their Easter experience knew that they had encountered the Jesus they knew prior to his death, not simply a vivid memory, a figment of the imagination, an hallucination, a spirit or ghost or immortal soul, or even some kind of apparition. Jesus himself, in the appearance to the disciples in Luke 24, for, it forecloses that sort of interpretation by saying, look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I, myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost, which is what they thought they were seeing, does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And as they remained uncertain, he asked, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it in their presence. In other words, Christian faith does not merely affirm that Jesus is alive with God. nor simply that in some sense he is still spiritually with us. It claims that Jesus is bodily risen, or that the risen Jesus is bodily. He can be seen, heard, touched. We believe in the resurrection of the body. But would it not be much easier to present the challenge of Christian faith if we could finesse that insistence on the body? <laughs> Proclaim that Jesus is alive, immortal, with God, influencing us, and so on, but agree that, his, that after his death, his body went the way of all flesh, namely that it returned to the earth and was reabsorbed into the cosmic process as, we all, as our, all, all our bodies after we die. Wouldn't that work better <laughs> for catechesis? Does it really make any difference whether the resurrection of Jesus was bodily or not? And if so, <laughs> what 
what does bodily mean? Paul, our earliest written witness to the resurrection, had to deal with this issue head on in relation to his Corinthian converts. They asked when he preached to them the resurrection, well, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? And Paul, sorry. So they asked, they asked Paul, what about this risen body? And Paul did not brush off their question as naive or unimportant. For two simple but extremely important reasons, the bodiliness of the resurrection makes a huge difference. First, our bodies are not just houses in which we dwell, or shells, or husks, or even as Socrates taught, the prison of our soul. No, our body is our self. We do not say, for example, do not hit my arm, or my body feels sick. We say do not hit me, or I am sick. In a more technical language, one's body and all its extensions are the symbolic way of being oneself in the world. A symbol is not a sign that is something that stands for something other than itself, the way an exit sign stands for a door. A real symbol is a way of being present of something that cannot otherwise be present. A symbol is not a stand-in for something that's absent, but the bodying forth and the reality that is present. That is the very reason why in the Judeo-Christian tradition, God is the utterly transcendent. It could only reveal God's self to people, to Israel, through actions, through history, through persons, and so on. The final, greatest, and most, and finally complete, absolute self-revelation of God is God's Word, who became flesh, who became incarnate in Jesus. Jesus is bodily a human. And being bodily and being human are equivalent. Jesus is the great symbol of God, not a representative of God, but God's very self. If in death Jesus had ceased to be his bodily self, he would not simply have laid aside a temporary vestment that he had taken on, or a container of some sort, he wouldn't have ceased to be a human being. That is, to be himself, Jesus, the one in whom our humanity <coughs> participates in God's life, and God's life is given to us. In other words, if Jesus had ceased to be a bodily human being, what we call the incarnation, God's becoming one of us, that we might become one with God, would have ceased. The incarnation would have come to an end. Bodiliness is intrinsic to Jesus' integral humanity. Only as bodily could Jesus rise as himself, and not as a trace or reminder of himself. And the second reason derives from the first. Bodiliness is the mysterious feature of our humanity by which we are simultaneously both present and absent, both related to all creation and distinct from all else. No one else is me, and I am not anyone else. The symbol which affects and maintains that distinctness is my body. <coughs> but conversely, it is through our bodiliness that we can enter into relationship with what is other than ourself. We can form community. Our experience of the death of a loved one is precisely that presence is overwhelmed by absence in the moment when the body ceases to mediate the person ceases to symbolically body forth the, present, the person in this context. We no longer call the fleshly trace in the coffin a body, but a corpse, which is the symbolic presence of an absence. That is why a corpse is so mysterious, indeed awesome. In death, the body is trans-symbolized, so that what had made the person present now makes the person absent. Jesus' body is no less important, significant, symbolic for him than ours is for us. Jesus was present in, to his pre-Easter contemporaries as his bodily self.
He was rendering God symbolically present to them. The church has always claimed that Jesus' death was not a charade, a piece of theater. He really died. His bodilyness, which made him symbolically, that is really present to his contemporaries, became a corpse, which made his absence symbolically, that is really present, present to those who buried him. Jesus was gone as completely and truly as is any person who dies, and his body, now become a corpse, was the symbolic expression of that transformation from life to death, from presence to absence. Therefore, if Jesus, after his death, is truly to return alive to his own, to be really humanly present in and among them, he can only do so through his bodily resurrection. But, and this is supremely important, Jesus does not come back to life. He does not reanimate his corpse, in other words. It's not a reanimation. He is not resuscitated, which would just have made it necessary for him, like Lazarus, to die again. And Paul said emphatically, death no longer has dominion over him. Rather, as we struggle for words for this transformation, we might say that the finite, mortal character of Jesus' earthly life, what scripture tends to call the flesh, which limited his divinity by mortality, was swallowed up in his very real death. Now, in his divine bodily humanity, which was glimpsed for a moment in the transfiguration, is now totally and definitively and absolutely revealed. Resurrection does not obliterate Jesus' humanity, it transforms it, transymbolizes it, or, to use the traditional language, glorifies it. The Jesus who rose from the tomb was not the earthly, physical, fleshly Jesus resuscitated, but the incarnate Son of God bodily glorified. We need to learn how to think of bodiliness not as equivalent to physicality, which is our earthly way of being bodily, but as the special way of being present of humans. The resurrection appearance narratives and Paul's experience of the risen Jesus give us a kind of repertoire of language and images by which to think about what bodily glorification or resurrection really means. The person who lives as bodily glorified, although continuous with him or herself, is in a different relationship to presence and absence that is the mortal alive before death. The unusual beyond mortal or earthly features in the Eastern narratives provide a whole collection of seemingly incompatible affirmations. Jesus can be simultaneously present to people in different and even widely geographically separated places. He can be present to people who knew him well and not be recognized. But he can be recognized by those to whom he chooses to reveal himself even if they never met him in the flesh, like Paul. He's not impeded by solid barriers like walls. He can, but does not have to eat. He knows where, where people like Thomas are and what they are thinking and saying when he is not present. In other words, a glorified body is not just a mortal body that glows in the dark <laughs> or walks through walls. Glorification is a condition of bodiliness which renders it not limited by physicality, by space or time or causality. The risen Jesus lives in God, not in our physical condition of materiality, but in a glorified materiality, which on the one hand enables him to participate in our mortal reality as he wills, but also leaves him free of its limitations, all of which are in some way related to death. Thus, the early church captured the meaning of the bodily resurrection of Jesus by saying, not only that he was alive, but that death no longer had dominion over him. This is not something we can easily fathom or imagine. We are talking about genuine bodiliness in which the body as flesh, that is as mortal, does not control the spirit, but the spirit controls, uses, acts through, and by means of, materiality in whatever way is needed. 
Glorification means no longer subject to death, nor anything which leads to death, results from death, or expresses death. Glorification is not the eradication of the body, which is the way of being or living human person. It is the end of subjection to death. What the bodily resurrection means for us is that Jesus himself is alive yesterday, today, and the same forever. Thank you so much, Sandra. Your nuanced, phenomenological analysis of the resurrection has only invited us to listen, but it's invited us to think deeply about the means of resurrection. Thank you very, very much. We will now bid farewell to our satellites and remote location. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to invite uh, Teresa de Rome to come up with a special guest for a presentation to Sandra. Tonight we have two gifts, uh, one for Sandra and one for everyone in the audience. Um, this is Will Pupa, he's the artist in residence for the Marymount Institute for Faith, Culture, and the Arts. And afterwards there's a wonderful reception upstairs, and you will see a beautiful large bas relief that he has made, sculpted and uh, cast in bronze, of the founding of the Religious and the Sacred Heart of Mary. Um, and um, Sister Sandra Schneiders has reminded me, gently, that she is not a member of the Religious and the Sacred Heart. she has redefined for all of us in her palimpsestic reading of the resurrection, what it means that all may have life. Everybody who's here gets one free copy and after that.